And she ended up getting yeah. pretty well. Yeah. Put on yeah. the system. I asked for more money for her for this. Like, I wouldn't be. I mean, I would. Yeah. And so, like, the end is I thought the same thing. Like, that's what I said. Hey, Mike. 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 Hey, M
Then there's been a rash of that on Capitol Hill. People breaking car windows about this seven minutes. They didn't take anything. You know, a lot of places yeah. are over the shit. Scared them away. It's pure vandalism for no oh, reason. For no reason. Right. I just heard, I was not yeah. listening to the radio. I wasn't thinking either. I was thinking about it too. One time in my neighborhood, I had to go to a hospital, and I was in the same with a Facebook blog, and every other car. Thank God. In 1985. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like he can stop it. Yeah, yeah he says he can. Random. Well, why doesn't they start doing like that? Maybe it's just going to buy them off. If you quit killing people, I'll give you a gun. But there's other ways. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> I'm going to Europe in a couple of months. I hope this doesn't interfere, but I'm not going to. I'm going to be up north. Oh, yeah. Well, who would have thought Brussels would be a yeah. place to be coming from? Well, this is retribution. For yeah. It. Only because of that, probably. Mm -hmm. yeah. You remember they had that thing in Sweden a couple of years ago where they thought they just shot all the people in the island. Yeah, I'll try to get that. So it's that. even in countries like it's that. Normally, I get that clean out. Absolutely. Yeah. The last country in the world. No place to stay. Yeah. 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 I wonder what their motivation is. Yeah. Yeah. Just to wreak havoc. They're not, yeah. not going to win. All they do is like to disrupt all. That's right. It's just fear yeah. and intimidation and fear. Yeah. 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 No yeah. I say. Yeah. Yeah. One year. I don't think it'll work there, but I, you know, in Africa, yeah. places like that, it's probably going to work. They stop warlords. I know. And they may be able to convert them all to this uh, extreme Islam. It's my intimidation area. For us, it's just uh, uh, obviously a scare tactic. Very effective. Yeah, I mean, you look at their, what they're trying to do. They're spending as little money as they are. They sure disrupt their. Oh, no question. Look at them. They have a little airport in here. Yes. 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 Y
coming every year very kindly from the ID part of AID, Allergy and Infectious Disease, and giving us a talk by this title, Infectious Disease for the Allergist. It seems to me that every year world events give him a unique title. I think last year Ebola virus was a major significant issue in his life and in world events, and now uh, Zika virus. So uh, interesting to hear that and other things directly related to our practice. Yeah, thank you so much, and uh, good morning, everyone. I think, yeah, this is my sixth year coming, and you guys keep inviting me back. So at this point, it's on you if, <laughs> if it's a problem. Uh, so, yeah, so every year I come and sort of just think about topics. You know, I review the literature, and there's always, you know, interesting discussions and papers on, you know, even efficiencies that have been, you know, described, which you actually know way better than I do. And But there's usually tends to be small I try to look for big overarching themes. Uh, and sometimes there are, sometimes they're not. And then I sort of go back to sort of the, just sort of the big ID topics uh, over the last year. And that's sort of where we are this year. There's uh, one part there that's more directly pertaining to your practice, but more just general uh, infectious diseases. Um, so the topics for today, uh, the Zika virus update. I know that you've seen this a lot in the news, but it may not be nice to get some of the facts in case some of your uh, patients are asking you. I know lots of people are asking around. Travel, and so that may be helpful. I'm going to pick up a little bit on last year's uh, discussion around uh, emerging infectious diseases and talk about some of the response and how this actually applies uh, to the practicing allergist and immunologist. And then also uh, this question of a cure for C. difficile infection. Uh, I know that we don't see a lot of C. diff uh, in the outpatient. It does happen out there. But the kind of the, where we are right now, the, sort of the state of the art, is actually kind of an interesting topic. So I just wanted to touch base on that as well. And of course, I'm always happy to stop and talk about anything you want to talk about or if you have any questions as we go along. This has always been a fantastic group of people with lots of uh, questions and answers, so feel free. So this is a uh, the front cover of JAMA just uh, from 2014, uh, and it sort of encapsulates a lot of the way I sort of see the world. People always ask me, you know, say, what do you do? I'm like, I'm an infectious disease doctor. They're like, doesn't that like freak you out or bother you? And um, in some ways, maybe, but in a lot of ways, no. But, you know, this is, it's kind of hard to see, but there's basically this person up here, a physician, with this sort of storm coming in, gowned and gloved and masked. And in the background, you see things like drug resistance and climate change and all those sorts of things. New viruses, old bacteria, sort of ones we've caught and took, taken care of over time. But it's a continuously evolving field, which is one of the things I really enjoy. And the idea of new Pathogens moving to the world is, you know, it's terrible for the population, but it makes it a very interesting uh, sort of perspective to have. And so I thought this cover sort of encapsulated a lot of those things uh, in the way I sort of, I do see the world. Not frightening, but fairly pragmatic. This paper came out, um, sorry you can't see it because it's cut off at the bottom there, uh, but this paper came out uh, about last, two years ago, so it was, no, spring of last year. Um, and it's basically a big epidemiological study. Can everyone hear me if I walk away from this? Yes. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah there are microphones in the ceiling. Fantastic. So I just want to make sure. Um, this was a paper that came out, and it basically was looking at all the epidemiology and infectious diseases going on around the world, and basically made a prediction model for potential hotspots for elevated risk for disease outbreaks in 2014-2015. So all of uh, kind of the last two years. Um, and you can see there's a... the, the, the uh, uh, different diseases are listed down there, chikungunya, cholera, dengue, hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome, hantavirus, malaria. Um, There's a pointer, right? Well, maybe, yeah, you have a pointer on your back. Yeah, right? does this work? No, it does not. It did. It does it? Oh, there it goes. It's trying. Oh, it's trying? Okay. There we go. I'm not so sure it's yeah. really super That's helpful. Pointer, it's so. pretty small. <laughs> yeah. But uh, what I'm pointing at down here at the bottom, it says plague, respiratory viruses, and Rift Valley fever over here. And so um, this, this paper came out last spring looking at hotspots around the world for emerging infectious diseases. And you notice there's a big gap, right, which is sort of the topic of the first part of today's talk. No one thought about Zika virus. Like, even though we're paying attention and, you know, we've, I showed you that picture from Jan, we're always looking out there for all these things. No one predicted Zika popping out. In a similar way that no one predicted Ebola popping out and being a big problem, it's still not up there, right? No one predicted H1N1 coming out of Mexico. So as, much, as good as these uh, prediction models are and the diversity of diseases that we're looking at, including ones that affect our neck of the woods, 
um, you know, it's somewhat unpredictable. Can I ask you a trivial question? Please. Where did the name Chicken Gunya come from? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's Chicken Gunya originated in, uh, I think, around Madagascar, so uh, along the African coast of the Indian Ocean. And I think it comes from a local language. Uh, to, it's, I think it means, like, to bent over because of the, the pain associated, the kind of muscle pain with it. It makes people kind of bend over. Okay. So I think Chicken Gunya comes from that term. In case they ask on Jeopardy. Yes, there you go. <laughs> I, I think it's Kiswahili. I, I have to remember it. I think it is Kiswahili. But I'm not 100% sure. I mean, it's a, that's a fascinating disease in and of itself. I mean, it's sort of an eclipse by Zika, but chikungunya, just as an aside, as you asked, um, you know, was really not a problem in South America and the Caribbean until just recently. And it's actually swept across uh, this hemisphere and has now become endemic. Uh, I have colleagues working and living in Puerto Rico. All of them have gotten chicken gunya now at some point. This disease it just wasn't there uh, in a way that uh, uh, it used, you know, even a few years ago. So this is, uh, this is the headlines from uh, the New York Times uh, health section on Sunday. Puerto Rico braces for its own Zika epidemic. Intensive efforts to stop the virus have begun on the island where a quarter of the population will get it within a year. That's pretty astounding. An infectious disease that's going to affect a quarter of the population. Um, and there's a, obviously a big issue. They have a, a pictures of uh, young babies here, young mothers, parents, and pregnant women. Because of this uh, concern for microcephaly uh, that's been highlighted in the literature. So this is a very big concern for lots of folks. And you guys have seen some of the responses in the paper. You know, Costa Rica or some of the countries saying, just don't have babies the next couple of years, right? Not really an effective public health response, um, but really making people pretty worried. So this is just a quick snapshot. This is called healthmap.org. Uh, it's all free to every, everyone, and they have a Zika-specific map going on right now. Um, and every dot is where there's been outbreaks of Zika, or at least reported cases. So in North America, most of those are individual or very small number of cases. Um, in South America, Central America, and Caribbean, those are ongoing big outbreaks, but you can see scattered ones throughout the world, mostly travel associated and ongoing transmission cases in South Pacific, South America, and the Caribbean. These are the countries where it's actually happening, where transmissions we know is happening. Um, so interestingly, does anyone know when Zika was first described? 1947. Exactly. It was described in 1947. And it was described in a uh, non-human primate, in, in a rhesus macaque. Yeah, was, that's such a big question. <laughs> so it was described in Uganda in a, in a non-human primate in an infectious disease uh, experiment where the animals were caged. Um, it was described just a couple of years later in the first humans in Nigeria. So this is a disease that's been around for a long time. But it's never really made an impact. It's never made the splash that many other emerging infectious diseases have even though it's been around for, we've known around about it for around 60 plus years. There have been, uh, you know, outbreaks that we think have been going on in, in, in Africa. Probably many of these non-shaded areas are just places where we haven't done the testing. Um, and uh, the first big outbreak was really back in the uh, mid-1990s in South Pacific, and then another big outbreak in the early 2000s, also in the South Pacific. And then this massive explosion uh, stretching across the South America and the Caribbean, all the way up to Puerto Rico. Any questions so far? Well, why all of a sudden this explosion? Yeah. Are you going to get to that? Yeah, I'm going to get to that. So just quickly, um, going through some of this, the basic facts. So Zika virus is transmitted mostly by mosquitoes. I'll go a little bit more on, about that. We know about this transmission from mother to child, so vertical transmission. There's this new finding of transmission uh, via sexual contact, right? We, even though we've known about this virus for 60 years, we did not know about sexual transmission of Zika virus until just the last several months. And then blood transfusion. If you go back and look in uh, the islands that were affected in the South Pacific, somewhere around 3% of all uh, blood donations are seropositive for Zika virus. So people, it's, it's been uh, through that population. Now here's the tricky part, getting back to your question. Only one out of five folks have any symptoms. So most people with Zika virus in their blood, or by remit, have no symptoms. We'll come back to that. For those who do, the most classic ones are fever, rash, and joint pain, which look often look like dengue and chikungunya. 
and then conjunctivitis, so sort of red eyes. Symptoms typically last a few days, pops up usually within a few days of transmission, and really importantly, and hopefully this bodes well for vaccine efforts in the, in the next year or so, you can only get infected once. So once you get infected, clear the virus, uh, you cannot get infected again. But the really big part here that I would take away is that most people have no symptoms despite viremia. So again, why did this make a big deal this year? Well, there was a big spike uh, in microcephaly cases. I'll show you some epidemiology in a minute. I think everyone here knows what microcephaly is, but uh, just to give you an illustration, I always sort of say, you know, the face size is about the same in each of these infants, but the head size gets smaller. There's babies with microcephaly and a baby with severe microcephaly. Um, and these are associated with things like occasional death, but also seizure disorder, learning uh, delays, um, brain calcification, sometimes retinal problems, but a lot of, a whole host of, of, of problems. And so you can imagine if you were to have a bump up in the, under, in the baseline rate of microcephaly cases, the impact is quite large, not only for that infant and for the family, but for uh, populations as well. The other one that's very interesting as well is this Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is described in the South Pacific outbreak as well. Uh, the estimate right now is it's probably about one, per four, one case of Guillain-Barre per about 4,000 cases. So just to think about that, if you're talking about hundreds of thousands of infections and a rate of Guillain-Barre of one per 4,000, you're talking about hundreds of Guillain-Barre syndrome cases. Severe Guillain-Barre requires intensive care, intubation, you know, less severe requires around the clock hospitalization, um, but a really huge impact uh, problem. Now, again, both of these diseases we think are associated with infection of neural tissue. The exact connection hasn't been made. We know in vitro you can uh, infect neural uh, cells with, with the Zika virus. And we know that um, we're finding Zika virus in babies who were born with microcephaly. And so the, the exact perfect connection hasn't been made, but it seems to be pretty well uh, described. And this is sort of an illustration of what happened. Microcephaly happens, and it's tracked in many places. And so you can see those low bars down along uh, the lower axis, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, are sort of in these different states in Brazil, the microcephaly now. So we have a baseline number that happens all the time. Here in the United States, we see cases and so forth. And what you can't see behind that little screen there is 2015 here. And these are the states. And you can see some states uh, really overly represented. But basically, what was seen by public health was a big spike in microcephaly cases. And the same, so someone or a group of people made the connection, we're seeing a lot of microcephaly cases, and we're also seeing this new virus that's getting around, which we don't think has any impact. But then they started doing some case control studies and looking at the incidence of Zika virus, Zika virus positive serology tests in the women who are giving birth to these children. And so this is where things really uh, kind of went off the rails at the end of last year. Uh, as I said, microcephaly, is a, we know that happens for all different reasons, but there was this huge spike in the number of cases that really got everyone uh, very, very concerned. And when you start talking about widespread epidemics, I just talked about Guillain-Barre, if you're talking about uh, the, you know, high-level spike like this and the public health as well as the personal impacts, uh, it's a very uh, concerning problem. Um, so that's microcephaly. Here's uh, uh, Guillain-Barre sort of connection. Uh, and a question on the microcephaly. Yeah. What about children in early infancy, if they're infected, do they have retarded growth? Not that I know of, brain? no. I assume maybe very, very early perhaps, but it appears to be uh, the only cases I know about of microcephaly are children who are, are uh, in, what's it, in placenta, in utero. In, utero. in, utero. in placenta, <laughs> in utero, sorry. But I don't know of uh, neuro impacts after. I don't think you'd have necessarily the microcephaly cases, but you may have uh, more subtle developmental problems that I, I would bet wouldn't have been detected. But you don't get meningitis. Not, no, no case of meningitis. Is there any <coughs> evidence or any signs that when these island the, the prior outbreaks that there was evidence of microcephaly? No. Is this a newer phenomenon? This is, and I, but I think it's a combination of where you have robust public health systems with a large enough population. Reporting, so it was, it was capturing, you know, something that doesn't happen very often. But when you get a large enough population, and again, we'll come back to this question about why um, this is spreading there. I think you've, I've already given you some clues. Can it happen at any point during the pregnancy? Does it happen early? And I'm trying to remember. There is some data about the timing. I don't remember exactly the timing, but I think the earlier, you know, any time during those first, especially I think the earlier part of the pregnancy. 
So here's uh, an epidemiological link with the uh, light orange bars being cases of Zika virus and then the dark orange being cases of Guillaume Barre. So you can sort of see it follows as the peak comes, the peak of Guillaume Barre follows. So again, these epidemiological links. And again, this was described in the South Pacific outbreaks. So this was known. None of this was described in Africa. And the thinking is that in Africa, it's probably been there for a long time, uh, and so most people are immune, right? Unlike the new epidemic, where we're seeing a very large number of people who are not immune. There's no immunity in the Western Hemisphere, basically. And you remember what I talked about with viremia. Only one out of five folks are, are symptomatic. So that means four out of five folks, unlike chikungunya, unlike dengue, are going to work or going to school or going about their day, right, where they are accessible to mosquitoes while they're viremic. So you have a perfect situation. You have a brand new population of folks, all of whom can get infected, none of whom have an immunity, Many, most of whom are going to walk around while they're viremic, get exposed to new mosquitoes, and just push on that transmission. So it's kind of a perfect situation for rapid expansion following an introduction. So um, this is the vector, the major vector. This is uh, 80s mosquito. You can see those nice white dots along the thorax and abdomen. Uh, Aedes aegypti is also called the yellow fever mosquito. It's also referred to as the aggressive biting mosquito. Um, Aedes aegypti is the, the major one. Uh, it also spreads chikungunya. It spreads dengue viruses, which can look somewhat similar to uh, Zika, uh, aside from microcephaly and Guillain Barre stuff. Um, chikungunya and dengue tend to be very symptomatic, tend to keep people at home. Um, but you can see how this could sneak in to some extent. Same vector, somewhat similar presentations. These particular mosquitoes lay eggs in standing water, and they're day and night biters, which is another big problem. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether you're inside or outside. It doesn't matter whether it's day or night. Um, these guys will go after you, and they'll bite you all the time. So again, you have the worst possible vector in terms of a mosquito. Aedes albopictus is a less aggressive mosquito, and um, but it can also transmit it. But the major ones, aegypti. And just uh, for the sake of of this, uh, just doing it. So basically, you know, they, they need a viremic person, right? So that asymptomatic person walking around who's viremic, the mosquito takes a blood meal, it gets aspirated up to the GI tract, it gets back into their bloodstream, and then circulates back up to their um, uh, their salivary glands. And so when they go from the to the next person, right, the next uninfected, unexposed person, then they take a blood meal. Remember, these are only females who are about to have uh, babies. That's you know, mosquito saliva then is dropped into that uh, wound, and then that's how the virus moves around. So the key things, you need an uninfected person, right? You need a mosquito to feed on a viremic person. So you take a mosquito, it's born, it feeds, moves on a viremic person, moves to the next person. And again, if you're not symptomatic, you're out there walking around, and you're exposed to all these guys. So it's actually a perfect situation, as I said, to, for rapid expansion. Does that answer your question? Well, it doesn't exactly answer why for 40 years or 50 years we didn't have epidemics of this, and now it just exploded now. Well, I think what it's done is over the last 60 years, it's slowly marched its way across the Indian Ocean, South Pacific, and just finally hit Easter Island was the first sort of uh, outbreak, you know, which is off the coast of, of uh, Chile. And then it got into Chile and then started, it just once it got there, you know, all you needed is the distance of a mosquito to fly. So the point is it found an uninfected, non-immune population. And that's all it's done across yeah. for the last 60 years is, you know, so it's, hot, it's had to hop across all the little islands of the South Pacific. And as soon as it hit mainland, uh, South America, and it's, everyone's unexposed except for Sub-Saharan Africa. So that basically every step of the way it's unexposed. And also you need to have those mosquitoes. So quickly, numbers in the United States. Um, right now, we've got, as of two days ago, 258 folks, um, 18 of them are pregnant, uh, and six cases are sexually transmitted. So again, a much, I, th I think, I mean, it's a small number, absolutely, but a, a lot proportionally, I'm kind of surprised by the number of cases that are sexually transmitted in the United States. No acquired cases, this is one of those things that patients may be asking. We've had no locally acquired cases in the United States, zero. In U.S. territories, um, Locally acquired, so up to 283. I just told you if we start this whole thing off with uh, the Puerto Rico epidemic, that's just gonna, you know, that has the potential to just explode and cross over that whole island. 
Um, this is just an outbreak. It's not meant to read all the numbers. So there's sort of an estimate of the total number of cases suspected and confirmed at the bottom. Uh, deaths are very few. There have been some deaths reported associated with Zika, but with a lot of comorbidities. The thing that's really important here is that left-hand column. Central America, Latin America, uh, Andean South America, the Southern Cone, and non-Latin Caribbean. The point is, is that it's involving dozens and dozens of countries. Um, and it's continuing to spread uh, throughout this area. Any place where it hasn't been in the Caribbean, Central America, Mexico, and South America, it will be. Or it's not being reported. I think when this uh, sort of popped up in the news a month or so ago, I started getting emails from people saying, I'm going to X. Can I go? And I'm pregnant, or I'm going to be pregnant. And they'd say, I look it up, and for instance, someone emailed me about the Galapagos. I'm going to the Galapagos in <coughs> April or something. And I said, Well, let me look. There's no nothing in the English literature about Galapagos being a problem, but you go and find the Spanish language literature, and there's definitely cases there, too. So this is having a profound impact on folks. If you are a childbearing, a female of childbearing age who's potentially going to get pregnant or is pregnant, basically, the recommendation is not to go here, any of those places. That's a big part of the world, um, and it, so it's really uh, profound. The other thing is we know about a big sporting event about to launch. Yeah here, right, uh, with people coming from all over the place, most of whom have never seen Zika virus, right? So Guillain-Barre, microcephaly, as well as just the symptoms. Um, very complicated problem. Can you, can you remind me of these mosquitoes, like how long do they live, and then are they actually traveling, or how are they getting to these different um, well, I, the, I mean, I, I'm trying to... Repeat question. Yeah, so the question is, how long do 80s Egypti mosquitoes live? And I don't remember off the top of my head. I think it's not very long, you know, four to weeks. Um, yeah, I read it was like 12 days or something, 12, 14 days. Yeah. And the virus, it's like this, you've got 24 hours where it's going to die better if it's still, the female's still living, it's infectious, yeah. so it's about two weeks. So then, yeah, so about, yeah, about a couple weeks. And, um... So the second part of your question was, around how is it moving? And I, and I guess it's a combination of mosquitoes can basically lay eggs in any standing water. There's all kinds of movement between uh, countries and across the ocean in vehicles and vessels that have standing water. So the eggs just sit there. Um, the other thing is viremic individuals can certainly move. If you're feeling fine, it takes you, you know, we all know this. It takes less than 24 hours to get from here to anywhere in the world. Right? And all it really takes is the introduction of one or two or a few people. So when it moved to the Easter Island, there's a big movement between Easter Island and Chile, since it's part of Chile. And so you can see how people move between these countries and just sort of march across. Was there a difference in Colombia and Brazil with the deaths reported from it? There's no deaths at all, and then you get the, those two countries, and there's seven deaths between the two of them. You know, I, I suspect it probably has more to do with testing. And, and being aware. So the Brazil outbreak was really, they're the folks who sort of first recognized this association with microcephaly and the number of cases, and they're dealing with the most, the greatest number of cases. Um, but I suspect, you know, I, the later ones are going to be more aware of it and going to be testing people who are sick versus the earlier, the countries that kind of got on board earlier. I, from what I understand reading about this is that it's a very, very rare complication, and how to exactly assign Zika virus as the cause of death is questionable. So uh, this is sort of an overlap. It's a little hard to see, but basically it's the same map I showed you before with all the dots indicating outbreaks and individual reports. The thing that I want to point out here is that is this color, this sort of heat map back here with red being more dense uh, or higher number of 80s Egypti mosquitoes. So you can see up here, this is Egypti, which is the aggressive fighting mosquito. Um, all throughout this affected area, you can see all throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, up here into the Caribbean. But I also want to point out the same sort of density of Aedes aegypti is in the southeastern United States, particularly along the Gulf Coast. So the vector for this particular virus is here. We do know that um, there have been cases of what's called autochthonous or locally acquired dengue fever in Key West, about 20, 22 cases, based on retrospective sero serological uh, studies. Right now, again, no cases of Zika. We have no Aedes aegypti up here in the upper left corner. Um, but, you know, this is something that we do need to pay attention to. As it moves rapidly across this part of the world, there's nothing really stopping it from getting into the
the same population of mosquitoes. They're here. If you actually look at the albopictus, which is the less aggressive one, it actually, albopictus extends all the way up here to probably the New York range. So a very common mosquito. There's an outbreak of dengue right now in the Big Island of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. What's spreading it there? Same, I think Same. it's Egypti. It is Egypti. Yep. Dengue is, you know, is a kind of a waxing wane thing. It's been around for centuries in this part of the world. Um, and why it does that, not entirely clear. It's often been confused a little bit with some chikungunya. There's some question about whether chikungunya used to be there and what we used to call it dengue. And now we call one thing dengue, and the new thing's chikungunya. It's a little confusing. Chikungunya appears to be this new reintroduction to this area. And we don't really know why that happened either. And that's all happened right underneath our noses. In the last two years, chikungunya swept right all across the same area. So prevention, the key thing here is prevention of mosquito bites. Um, you know, we have very effective methods, permethrin and heat and so forth, wearing long sleeves, staying home while you're ill, but remember only one out of five people have symptoms and they can be quite minor, uh, but you're the vibrant person who's gonna uh, get to uh, infect that next female mosquito. Um, for if you've been infected or you've been in an exposed area, so this is challenging. So if you come back, right now the recommendation is you are male who traveled, to one of the affected areas, you're coming back to the United States, um, and there's a question about whether you had Zika. Um, the recommendation now is abstinence, sexual abstinence, for several months. I think it's three to six months. Um, or condom use. Um, if you're pregnant and ill or exposed, uh, if there's concern, we do testing. There's a whole algorithm for those things now available through the CDC. And the goal there is once, if you do have an exposure and you are pregnant, um, there's nothing that can be done in order for treatment, but uh, the OBGYNs and pediatricians like to monitor the fetus with ultrasonography throughout the pregnancy so they can know what to expect and be able to take care of the baby as best possible. As I mentioned, no known treatment for Zika, but I'm really hopeful for a vaccine given the immunity, the natural carrying immunity that's there. <clears throat> Any questions on Zika? Has anybody pursued the idea of like immunoglobulin? Like, it seems like something that would have a very strong, if you only get infected once, right? very profound immune response. Oh, sure. So I think that the issue is that it's... Oh, sorry. So is, any, is there uh, any discussion or work around using immunoglobulin to uh, deal with this? I think uh, there's, I guess, three parts. One, it's incredibly widespread, which is going to link it to cost. Um, it'd be nearly impossible to give enough people. Most people with Zika have no symptoms, so you're going to continue transmission regardless of treatment. And uh, if you are infected, right, and you develop symptoms, whether treatment at that point will have an impact on pregnancy is unknown. Unknown, you know, the incidence of microcephaly. Is the development of Guillain-Barre only in those people who are symptomatic, or does it ever occur in those who were infected but asymptomatic? Do you know? I don't know. It's a great question. Subsequent yes. pregnancies for a mother who's already transmitted is, is not occurring. Is that correct? What's that? So, so, I'm sorry. If a, if a mother has Zika, transmits it to the baby. Yes. A second pregnancy no. is not affected. No. No, no, because no, she'll clear it by then. Yeah, so, so the question is, you know, uh, if a woman is infected during the first pregnancy, even if it affects that baby, is it a risk for the second pregnancy? No. So people, all, everyone clears this. There's no persistent primary. The, first, the other question was around uh, whether people only, there's an association between symptomatic Zika virus infection and the incidence of Guillain-Barre. Uh, as far as I know, no. But I mean, I, I, I don't know. Uh, but it's an interesting question. But since it's like in affecting the brain and the, the lining, I guess, there, are there late effects like they have with the Ebola uh, infected people? They're having recurrences like a year later with problems? It's, it's a fantastic question, and it's it definitely when I think about the sexual transmission. So uh, the question was around late on late effects of uh, Zika virus, and so one of the issues, as, as Bill was pointing to, is that Ebola virus uh, and also MERS. Uh, interestingly, there have been a couple of cases of late recurrent disease. So in the MERS outbreak in South Korea, one physician came back several months after being cleared with symptomatic MERS. Uh, so it appeared to be in some sort of latent state uh, in his body. <laughs> and then the Ebola virus uh, problem, uh, both the, one of the physicians here in the United States who's infected in West Africa and also the Scottish nurse have both uh, developed late onset sequela. The Scottish nurse with resurgent Ebola in her CSF 
uh, and the physician here in the United States with uh, detection of MERS in his uh, uh, the, the uh, fluid in his eyes. Uh, and so there appears to be late effects, but also but I think in, in, in the setting of persistent virus replication in those sites. Um, and so as far as we know, that's not happening, but I think that we're still very early in this. And so in the cases of Guillain-Barre, the cases of uh, microcephaly, I'm not so sure we, we know that yet. Um, but this idea of absence or condom use is pointing to the fact that there appears to be persistent Zika replication going on in some compartments of the body in a way that goes far beyond the blood compartment. And that's what we know from Ebola. Ebola virus is being isolated from semen months after infection in infected men. So I think that we don't know the answer right now. But it's, it's, it is really important. These are, I guess one thing to take away from that is that this is not simple. Just because you clear your viremia doesn't mean you clear the virus necessarily. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, shifting gears. So I don't think I've told this story before, but just quickly. Uh, this kid's name is David Ricci. He was a patient of mine several years ago. He's, he was about 21 years old. He was volunteering in an AIDS orphanage in Mumbai. Um, he was walking to work one day, walking along train tracks um, with his friends, uh, and he didn't hear it. A train came along slowly, grabbed his, he had a coat on, grabbed his coat, pulled him, and then uh, nearly imitated his right leg underneath the train. Um, he was put in a cart, brought to a local hospital. They sawed off the rest of his leg. Put him in a brought him to another hospital, spent about a week there. The wound kept opening and closing, got about three or four more surgeries. His parents went and got him uh, and had him flown to Harborview. Um, I got a call a couple days in his hospitalization. He was sitting on our 80s burn unit in a, in a room shared with another patient. So this is a unit with lots of open wounds and burns and high-risk patients. And the orthopedic surgeon, Doug Smith, said, hey, John, you've heard about this case, right? And I said, no. And he said, well, can you just bring him up? And I did. And out of this traumatic right upper, right lower extremity amputation site, he had all these drains and wounds and not healing. He had a lot of organisms growing. I had about, I think, four or five in that first one. Here's two of them. Pseudomonas originosa and Escherichia coli. And there's the uh, antibiotic susceptibility pattern. So I think everyone, from the, listening to the room, everyone knows what that means. All the R's mean resistant. I basically means resistant. In the United States, we have I's. In Europe, that would be called an R. Um, and if you look at the Kliston uh, MIC cities, they were at levels that I can't get that, set that drug level in the blood. So basically, pan-resistant gram-negative rods, these are only two of the, I said, four or five organisms uh, that were growing out of his leg. He was only a couple days in the hospitalization, again, sitting on our burn unit, right next to another patient. So I said, everyone stop, hold tight, he's fine. Doug, don't let anyone in or out. We quickly got him into contact precautions, and we didn't see any transmission of cases, thank goodness. But um, it did take me uh, a while to take care of this kid. As I was walking up the stairs, I saw this, hearing his history. I was, I was like, I was kind of aware of the literature around uh, what's going on in drug resistance. And I immediately came to mind was uh, this particular gene called Nudeli metallobetalacumis, which was described in 2009 by a guy named Tim Walsh out of the UK. And this gene conveys almost complete beta-lactam resistance. Um, it, all, it runs with the bad crowds, and the bacteria that have these tend to have genes associated with aminoglycoside resistance, chloroquinolone resistance, and many others. Some resistance, some are last-ditch drugs like tigacycline and colistin. And you see it in Klebs, E. coli, Citrobacter, Frundii. We saw it in his Enterobacter, we saw it in his E. coli, we saw it in his Pseudomonas. Um, uh, just really pretty much everything. And we had evidence, he had a Morganella that was early on, that was fairly sensitive, that later on developed the same level of resistance. To us, was it, we don't know whether there's a latent population or whether there's actually movement of this gene on a plasmid between the gram negatives. So very promiscuous. And since the description in 2009, right, so this is seven years ago, when I saw him, it was, uh, this was like three years ago, at that time it was 52 countries uh, after the initial description in India. Tim Walsh was banned from India. Uh, he was able to send, you know, never name something bad after a local place, right? You, never, you don't want to live in Ebola. You don't want to, you know, have New Delhi. You don't want to, you know, Middle East, we should, there's actually, because of all this, and because of this case, uh, you'll see all the diseases are kind of shifting away from name, name of the places to more descriptions. Um, because no one wants their home to be a horrible emerging infectious disease. 
So he was booted from there, was banned. He sent some research back in, posed as reporters, and actually did uh, water samples, <coughs> metropolitan water samples, and found uh, gram negative rods with this in the water samples. So the point is, E. coli is a normal part of your flora, uh, right? And so the point is that people are walking around in uh, New Delhi, Mumbai, wherever, uh, and other parts of the world with horrifically drug-resistant gram-negative rods in their abdomen and other places, just like we can be colonized with MRSA, right? And we know the problem is, is that when you get a skin infection or you get a surgery and you have MRSA in your skin, what's going to cause your surgical site infection, MRSA? If you get abdominal surgery or your neonate who gets a gram-negative rod infection in an ICU in uh, Mumbai, what are you going to get? NDM1 containing gram-negative rods. And when you have that level of resistance, you know, the options for treatment are few and far between. So David took me six months, took three more surgeries. Every part, every time his leg was a little bit shorter, I made him neutropenic, knocked out his kidneys once, um, lost 20, 25 pounds because I made him sick all the time. But eventually, after many, many courses of antibiotics, I got him cured. Um, the problem is, is that what I have access to and what the rest of the world has access to is not the same. Uh, and it's, to some extent, I got kind of lucky, and so did he, uh, with dealing with this. So the issue here I want to spend the next, you know, 10 or so minutes talking about is drug resistance. Because when we think about emerging infectious disease, you know, Zika is kind of cool, it's brand new, it's blowing up. But there is another emerging infectious disease that's occurring right underneath our noses right now. It's been going on for a while, and it's going to continue to get worse. And that's the emergence of drug-resistant bacteria. You know, we all got to get used to BRE and MRSA. But when you deal with untreatable organisms, we're in a, a bit of a pickle. And this has a big impact on our patients. Is that, that's not me beeping, right? Something else beeping? Okay, good. We know that people do worse. This is just a quick uh, slide looking at uh, the outcomes, basically death associated with uh, drug-resistant bacteria. So just quickly, there's E. coli, Klebsiella pneumonia, and Staph aureus. So if you look at E. coli, the way it's broken up there is if you're resistant to third-generation cephalosporins like ceftriaxone, commonly used antimicrobial in the hospital. If you look at the percentage of deaths if you're drug-resistant versus non-resistant, it's basically a two-fold difference. So if you have ceftriaxone-resistant E. coli infection, your risk of dying is two-fold greater, two times greater. If you look at the same thing, ceftriaxone resistance and cell pneumonia, it's roughly the same attributable mortality, two-fold increased risk. And we know about MRSA, it's about you know, 1.5 to 2, so we're right in the middle. So when you are infected with a drug-resistant bacteria, your risk of a hard outcome is notably worse, right? So you, it's obvious, if you had to get E. coli infection, which one do you want? And so when you start looking at multiply drug-resistant bacteria, you can imagine that uh, this gets even worse. And it has a big impact. Obviously, to our patients, they die, they do poorly. But to our countries and uh, healthcare in general, just look at the European Union on the left and the United States on the far right. Populations between 300 and 500 million. Attributable deaths directly to drug resistant bacteria, about 25,000, about 23,000. Many, many millions extra hospital days. Societal costs in the billions of dollars or euros, whatever you want. Just as importantly, I told you, this happened to David in India. Now, India has a hugely stratified uh, healthcare system. They have excellent healthcare to, available to those who have money. And then uh, for the vast majority of poor folks, the healthcare is uh, pretty terrible, right? It's really non-existent. Um, and in middle-income countries like Thailand, so 70 million folks dealing with more deaths, 38,000 deaths attributable, many millions of hospital days, and societal costs also in the billions of dollars, right? So when you start talking about those numbers, you're talking about big impacts on things like GDP, right? Big impacts on population health. And when you just look at attributable stuff, that's you know, number of hospital stays, hospital costs, patient deaths. There's been data now showing that places with, you know, uh, the issues around antibiotic drug resistance actually have impacts on GDP in general. So 1.4 to 1.6 percent as a result of these hospital stays, drug treatments, and bad outcomes. So not only are the direct costs, but the societal costs are quite dramatic. And again, when I make that parallel to other emerging infectious diseases like Zika and Ebola. Antibiotic resistance is the same thing. It's the same problem. It's new organisms, basically, causing huge problems. And um, I'm going to go through this part just a little bit quickly. This is just looking at the incidence of drug resistance by different countries. Uh, so if you look at, for instance, efficium, I'll try to use this again. So this is 
So 75% of our efficium is BRE, vancomycin resistant enterococci. If you look over here to strep pneumo resistant to penicillin tazobactam, that's every resident's favorite drug, right? Uh, with Piptazo, it's Zosin, right? Vancos, vanco, vancomycin and Zosin, they love it. 87% of, of the strep pneumo, which is the number one thing that causes pneumonia, the number one thing that causes meningitis, the number one bacterial cause of otitis media, uh, high level drug resistance. Um, Here's uh, Klebsiella pneumonia, right, in, our, in this room, Romania, right? 91% resistant to gentamicin. We don't even use gentamicin in the United States, except in pediatrics, really, um, and it's in very rare cases. But that's because it's like, and we don't have problems with real drug resistance. So you can just sort of see, just looking at all these, these high levels of resistance to all these different drug classes across a whole bunch of commonly occurring bacteria. So the point of sort of taking home from this is that this isn't just a industrialized country problem. It is a middle-income country problem, and it is a poor country problem. It is across the planet in all the countries uh, that have any access at all to antimicrobials. And the problem is this. Antibiotic resistance is not new, right? When we use antimicrobials, we apply selection pressure on a population of bacteria that already have pre-existing mechanisms for drug resistance. Most of our antibiotics are derived from naturally occurring compounds. This is a cool core sample study published in uh, Nature a few years ago. You know those ice cores they use for climate studies? So this is a tundra core. They go up to outside uh, Dawson City in the Yukon, go out to this frozen tundra and take these, co these cores. And they go back to the um, different levels. And what you can see here and where the mammoths are and the giant mice and stuff, um, there's this soil level about 45,000 years ago. And when they went there, they did a bunch of molecular studies. They were able to isolate a uh, whole bunch of stuff, including two genes, Van A and Van B. They don't know what Van A and Van B confirm? Confer? Vancomycin. Vancomycin. Yeah, exactly. Vancomycin resistance. So none of those animals were using vancomycin, right? So, but the genes were there from BRE 40, 50,000 years ago. And the point is that we're late comers into this problem of the bacteria and the fungi fighting each other over the last several billions of years. Right? So they've already figured out everything. Right? We know Flory <coughs> saw that mold killing off the bacteria around it. Right? So we're just exploiting that relationship, that problem that's been going on. And so the takeaway is when we add antibiotics, we are selecting for drug resistance inevitably, even if we use them perfectly. And we know that half the time in hospitals, we're using them inappropriately, at least. Here's just one example of that. This is looking at uh, antibiotic use. It's just a, an index. It's called the defined daily dose. It's just a way to normalize it for 1,000 inhabitants per day. So this is industrialized countries in the United States being in orange. So the takeaway here is variation. So in France, they use almost three times as many antimicrobials on volume than the Netherlands. You know, more than Spain, more than Australia, more than the United States. And it's not like France has some huge bacterial infectious disease outbreak is, that they're addressing. It's not like the Netherlands is incredibly, you know, cleaner than some other place, right, or hygienic. The point here is variation. Countries and practitioners in those countries use antibiotics in different ways. And that doesn't really make sense, right? We're supposed to be sort of a science-based process. Here in the United States, there's a similar variation. Dark blue means more antibiotics per day based on antibiotic prescriptions. So West Virginia is the highest at 1,214 antibiotic prescriptions per 1,000 people. That means on average, everybody in the state of West Virginia is getting an antibiotic prescription every year. Now obviously, it's not everyone. It's, it's the kid who gets three or four or five antibiotic prescriptions for otitis media um, or other comorbidities. Does this count using animals, or is this just using This does not count animals. This is purely humans. The animal thing, we could spend a whole Next year, I can talk about animals and <laughs> You guys listen to anything I talk about, so yeah. again, you, you keep it, it's on you now. <laughs> so 1,214. So in the best state, uh, this light blue, and I put, we're in light blue too, it's 513 antibiotic prescriptions per 1,000 people. That means one out of every two people is getting antibiotic prescription in the best state. That's, uh, we're talking about a lot of selection pressure and variation, right? Huge variation, two-fold variation in antibiotic prescriptions across states. And we know this is associated with problems at the country level. So again, looking at indexing antibiotic prescription of penicillins 
across this axis, and penicillin non susceptible strep pneumo, so pen resistant strep pneumo. Again, the most common cause of pneumonia, meningitis, and bacterial uh, otitis media. So <laughs> basically, the more antibiotic you use as a country, the more penicillin non susceptible strep pneumo you have. Remember, France? They use the most, they have the highest incidence of, strep, of uh, penicillin resistant strep pneumo. The Netherlands is the least, they have the lowest incidence. The United States is right here in the middle. But there appears to be a pretty strong association with just the kiloton your country uses of penicillin in instances of, of penicillin non susceptible strep pneumo. Seems pretty convincing, right? Whenever, I'm never going to be able to prove this perfectly, but these associations seem pretty strong. Here's at a hospital level uh, looking at the introduction of carbapenems. So it gets introduced in 2002, and they start looking at carbapenem resistance in Acinetobacter and Pseudomonas, two bad gram negatives that cause DAP, uh, generally, or other complicated infections in the hospital. Soon they start introducing, they start seeing drug resistance, carbapenem resistance in both these, and it going up and up and up and up. Now, again, it's not, you know, cause, you know, it's, it's an association, but it appears to be a pretty strong association. It's been replicated many, many times over. When we think about selection pressures, in the United States, there appears to be sort of a leveling off of antibiotics. So this is macrolides, specifically exithromycin. Sweden sort of coming down. But the rest of the world, particularly the poorer countries in the world, and the middle income countries, use is going up. And this is one of the conundrums. Most children who die of a bacterial cause under age five die without antibiotics. So at the same time they were over-prescribing antibiotics in many countries in the world, many places need, <clears throat> desperately need antibiotics. But is it what happens when you have things like NDM floating around in Mumbai? Like, how do you deal with that problem? Both high-level drug resistance, but that desperate need for antimicrobial delivery to kids with serious bacterial infections or other adults who appropriately need them. And so we do want to see antibiotic use go up in these countries, but it has to be thoughtful, sane antibiotic use in a way that we in this country haven't really done. This is the same thing looking at carbapenem sales in Pakistan, India, uh, West Africa, United States, Netherlands. So sort of leveled off in the United States, gone up and then kind of down the Netherlands. But look at India. I just showed you that carbapenem resistant infection. Skyrocketing. Pakistan, you know, basically if you come to Harborview from any part of the world outside of Canada or the United States, I put you immediately into contact precautions because of the incidence of highly drug resistant gram negative rods. We just assume it's happening, and most of the time we're right. Because these, there's a reason people are using carbapenems because they don't have a lot of choices. Places like Pakistan, Afghanistan, and India, this is an out-of-control epidemic. Are those drugs non-prescription in some of these countries? Yeah. You still buy them? Yeah, so that's one of the big issues, particularly in India. And that, that, that article on the NDM1s uh, led to some big changes there. So historically in India, you just go to the pharmacy, buy whatever drug you want, or you ask the person behind the counter. There's also, you know, not, not all physicians are trained at the same level. And so we see all kinds of uh, goofy recommendations. And people just want to get better, right? So, yeah, you get a couple doses of, you know, ertapenem or something for your rhinosinusitis, you get better anyway. And you also get drug resistant bacteria, right? But you, you, there's this connection. I used to work in Armenia, and we go out in the ambulances. And unless the person got a shot of something, they didn't feel like they were getting any good, right? It might have been a vitamin shot. It might have been, who knows? <laughs> It was all in Cyrillic, so I had no idea. But you know, this is a problem. This is a serious, serious problem. Um, I'm going to skip over this one. And part of the issue is that we've always relied upon new antimicrobials. And they're not, it's not happening. Even when you talked to us about tuberculosis, I sort of remember those same two countries were the ones that have the polyresistant TB. Yep. Is that, am I remembering same thing. correctly? So one of the big issues in India, you can get all the drugs for TB, over the counter. The people who prescribe it, you know, the, the people who say that they're physicians, it's not very well regulated. And when you go back and it's actually done like kind of anthropological, epidemiological studies of prescriptions for or treatment uh, for TB in India in these urban areas, and it's often done incorrectly. So people often get one or two drugs. They won't do susceptibility testing. When they have the susceptibility, they don't interpret them correctly. Um, and so they get the same drugs or the wrong drugs. Yeah, so it's it's a continuously evolving problem. It, that as as a human structure, as a that we're driving, we're doing this on our own. So uh, the point here is the pipeline for antimicrobials is is 
you know, it's not happening. I'd say that in the past couple of years, it's starting to perk up, mostly in the smaller biotherapeutics companies. They're starting to get novel things. The problem is we don't get any new drug classes. The last new drug class we have is daptomycin, which was, I think, around 14, 15 years ago now. Um, and so there's new drugs, some of the new beta-lactam, beta-lactam inhibitors, so like ceft ceftraxin or ceftazidine, plus the new BLIs like avibactam. Those look very promising, but they're not new classes, right? And what we're really looking for to deal with this is a new class of antimicrobials. But this is what we've relied on for, for you know, since 1950. And it, the big companies, they don't make money in antimicrobials. It's a totally, we know why. It's, it's not their fault, right? It's the way we set up things. Um, they're not going to make money doing this. And so I'm not going to go through all this, but the point is, is that we have lots of known mechanisms of resistance that are floating. I see people with AMC. I see people with ESBL or extended, spe extended spectrum beta-lactamase uh, around here. That's probably the most common mechanism of resistance. I see NDM1s very rarely. We track those at the state level. KPCs are Klebs, CL, and pneumonia carbapenemases. If you practice in New York, New Jersey, you definitely see those. We see it here. It's almost invariably someone getting off a cruise boat. They went from a New Jersey hospital, bucket list, go to Alaska, get sick, show up at Harborview, you don't see. If they have that, I know where they came from, right? Uh, fortunately, it hasn't gotten here, but it's actually gotten into LA now, and it's probably embedded there. And these are these are big, bad carbapenemases. This is no meropenem, no erdopenem, no imipenem, right? None of our gorilla and monkey cells. So I said, you know, as of like, you know, six months ago, I said, okay, we're, that's good. And then the apocalypse pig. You guys read about the apocalypse pig? So back in November, a paper came out of Lancet ID. So colistin, the last ditch antimicrobial we have for bad drug negatives, right? The last one we have, the one we use to treat all these bad, bad things. It's basically detergent, hurts kidneys pretty badly. Um, they use it like water in animals in many parts of the world, including China. And what uh, the agricultural folks there started seeing was evidence of colistin wasn't working quite that well. And so they went back and started looking at it, and they isolated a bunch of bacteria, gram-negatives, that were resistant to colistin, and they isolated a particular gene called MCR1. They're like, and then they showed some in vitro stuff, saying, oh, this MCR1 gene is the thing that's driving colistin resistance. And they went back and looked at animal samples, and they were able to find it everywhere. This gene is all over the place spread throughout China. All the agricultural sectors, they published the paper, uh, everyone's like, you know, this is terrible, this is awful, this is our last ditch drug, MCR1. Everyone else is like, okay, it's a China problem, we need to deal with it there. Public health is doing, you know, they've done a great job. The fact that they detect this is amazing. Um, they've done a great job. So, you can't see here with Denmark and some of the other northern Scandinavian countries. So, you know, let's just look. And they went back and looked at all the bank samples, and they found MCR1 in their samples as well from animals. And they've also, the Chinese went back and actually found it in patients' samples. So again, this is happening under our noses now. This is the last stage. If I see MCR1, I mean, what are we going to do? I don't have anything else. You know, I dealt with, with uh, uh, David Ricci with four different drugs, none of which had individual activity. But I was hoping in combination they're going to including colistin was the backbone. And if I see this, I don't even have that. So we're looking at completely drug resistant and gram negative rods. To everything, not, not, just like, not just like me saying drug resistant, like completely everything. Um, and this is a big problem. And I only have five minutes, but the answer uh, we have in the United States, I showed you it's kind of out of control in many other parts of the world, is you'll hear this term a lot. Actually in JAMA, just the most recent JAMA, they keep sending it to me. Um, there's two articles about antibiotic stewardship, and you're going to be seeing this a lot in your hospitals, and it's something that I think involves everyone. As I said, anybody who touches antimicrobials, consumes them, talks about them, is a steward of antibiotics because they are a common good, right? They're like oil or the, the grass in the middle of your city, right? Everyone owns it, um, and we can't, uh, you know, step back from responsibility around how we deal with these things. And stewardship is basically how do we approach these on an individual prescriber level, but also on a system level. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into all these things about it, um, but the idea is fundamentally, how do we get people, when, they, when, when do they get the right diagnosis? Is it a bacterial infection? Can we get them the right drug, the right dose, the right time, the right duration? Every time we do an antibiotic study, treatment study, we show that shorter courses of therapy work just as well as longer courses. Um, but a lot of times people don't need antimicrobials, and it has a lot to do with the conversations we have with patients. We have to be able to support them, uh, in recognizing that they don't need antibiotics all the time. 
Um, and but it's hard for us because we get trained um, by in, in this uh, you know apprentice model by senior folks uh, in behavior in our etiquette. And the etiquette is, goes extends to things like antibiotic prescription. You know, and the problem is, is if you look at the behavior of clinical leaders and seniors, they influence the practice of junior folks, but they consider themselves exempt. Right, so I can sit here and talk to the younger folks and say you really can't use antibiotics, and they'll listen to me. But if I go to someone who's, you know, senior to me, I say you can't use antibiotics that way. You know, it's hard because they learned a way that influences the practice that you know that they haven't seen a bad outcome from. Um, but it's around behavior change and etiquette, and that's ultimately this whole problem. What's going on in India? You know, a lot of it's regulatory, but it ultimately comes down to what are you writing, what are you selling, what are you prescribing uh, to give that person that's driving this problem. The animal problem is a whole nother one, um, which again, I could talk a lot about. We do a lot around antibiotic prescription uh, control at Harborview. Again, I'm not gonna go through all these things, but we actually have a very robust program around how to look at guidelines and restrict some antibiotics. At Harborview, you can't get a carbapenem anymore unless you have an ID uh, consult uh, because they're being used inappropriately. You know, guidelines, uh, we control what gets on the formulary, and we try to answer questions. So if you have a question about infectious disease, how can we answer it uh, appropriately to help prescribers so they're not out there on their own using antibiotics uh, inappropriately? So I'm going to close on one last thing because this is directly applicable to uh, this group here. And that's around, you know, I wish Matt was here because he's an expert in this area, penicillinology. This is something you guys are way more expert on than I am. But the point is it's really, really important part of stewardship. Penicillin allergy. And that's, you know, a lot, you guys know this. Lots of people have this documentation of allergy for penicillins. We know that of the 8 to 20% of people who say they have it, only 10% truly have an allergy based on your testing. Is that right? Yes? Lower. Lower. This is the number I saw in the most recent review, but it may be lower. So physicians, and the problem is when they see this, right, right people who don't have a lot of knowledge about this will choose a non-beta-lactam. And they just, as soon as they hear this, they'll go to something that's not beta-lactam. And we know that beta-lactam drugs are inferior, right? If you get vancomycin for your staph aureus infection, you're getting an inferior drug compared to a nice, strong beta-lactam, right? Um, for your MSSA, like napsilin or cephazolin. And they tend to be more toxic. Vancomycin will knock out your kidneys, right? We also know that patients who are treated this way tend to have more C. diff, more VRE, more MRSA because they're getting treated with drugs that select and drive resistance. So this is a huge issue. And Matt, uh, and working with Paul Pottinger at UWMC, um, I've been put a lot of work into how to put, put a protocol together around how to use allergy expertise in getting these allergies off the list. Because they are bad for patients. They're fundamentally bad for patients uh, for lots and lots of reasons. Um, they lead to bad outcomes, lead to bad uh, drug resistance. Um, and getting it off their list is incredibly important. And I think they've shown uh, through this rapid desensitization protocol. I wish Matt was here because he could speak more to it. But this is just one review just came out recently. You know, if you get a documented allergy, basically these folks need to get an allergy consult. Anybody who wants to work at Harvard View, come on over. Um, we, we would love your expertise. Yeah. Yeah? Okay, good. Um, <laughs> Dr. Bill, yeah. for service over there. Get this consult team to get the initial assessment, get inpatient evaluation, outpatient evaluation, and get an accurate documentation. This is, it feels like one small thing, but it is a huge thing with appropriate antibiotic use in the United States. Enormous. Um, and it has a big impact. So that's, uh, I'm going to close there given the time. I left you with a couple slides on C. diff. The only thing I'll take away on that is you can now get feces in a pill. You can swallow them in an office and cure your C. diff. Uh, but feel free to look it up on that last slide. And I'll be happy to take questions. As usual, I ran over to get excited. This is uh, just sort of a rhetorical question, but why do you think there hasn't been more progress with sort of new antibiotics? Is it literally economics? Or yes. Are we, it's much more lucrative to make a hep so, C pill? Or, yeah, so, know, or, so, yeah, I mean, hep C, even aside, so if you look at drugs, you have to take, uh, you've got to make more money, right? As I always tell people, companies exist to increase shareholder value, right? That's their job. And so... The way to do that is to get people to buy something every day for the rest of their life. 
too, now. Right. Because I, mean, I remember like eight years ago, I would listen to a talk by the head of anti infectives for GSK. Not yeah. that he was the guru, but yeah. he was talking about, you know, we cranked out H flu, all, we got all the genomes, yeah. we have identified eight to 12 new potential antibiotic targets, and there's nothing. Yeah, they're not going to maybe, maybe as it affects targets. more people, it'll be too little too late. Well, the, the, I mean, the thing is, is that they, yeah, so the, they, they just make more money making right. daily drugs or simple. Hep C drugs they, because they can spend it and it cures a problem. And, and again, being fair, when they introduce these drugs, people like me say, don't use it, don't use it, or use it for a very short amount of time until we absolutely desperately need it. Now, as I say, this, there appears to be a slight in that some of the smaller or medium-sized biotherapeutic companies appear to be kind of more innovative around these things. And, yeah. and what happens, you guys, you know, they, they, those guys develop something, and then one of the big companies buys them, and then they kind of develop it. So I've seen a lot of, of uh, this, especially these BLI combos, which look very promising. Um, and I think that that will continue. Um, but so I'm... I'm, I'm I'm somewhat optimistic. More optimistic now in the past couple years than I was probably well, five years ago. Some of these new, you know, interfering RNA. Oh, I think these could be. Also and so there's actually some of the really most take out yeah, the, the most yeah the, some of the most interesting work is around non-antibiotic right. antibiotics. So there's a couple of companies in town look at monoclonals, um, and yeah, so you know those there's, there's the Eastern Europeans look at bacteriophages. There's the interfering RNAs. There's there's I think the non-traditional antibiotics are really a great, great potential. Chloramphenicol that we used to use 70, 50 years yeah. ago, yeah. is it still is it making a comeback? It's, it's used in many parts of the world regularly. Uh, I have not gotten the chance to use it here. In cough um, medicine. In well, cough medicine. That's well, where no. they have chloramphenicols in cough in, medicine. In foreign countries. In, your, in Spain yeah. and Italy, they have it in cough syrup. You think there'd be no resistance now because nobody's been using it around yeah. here at all. Well, yeah, and, and uh, they're still using it pretty widely in many other parts of the world. So I actually don't know what the what the incidence yeah, is of chloramphenicol drug resistance. Uh, it'd be a, you'd have to be pretty desperate to use it here. Um, I like this young man well, you told us about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I thought about it. Well, it, that's what you know. One of those uh, drugs you might be able to pull out yeah. again and be of value. Yep. You know, they used to use it for meningitis, and it was bad. Right. For oh yeah, no, out. it's a fantastic drug aside from the. Uh, a plastic anemia. <laughs> you know, that was pretty rare, though. That was, that was rare. pretty rare, though. Yeah, yeah you know, absolutely. I think depending on how you deliver it, you can also have a different incidence, too. So I, think, I thought about it for him. Do you think we're going to get lucky, like with doxycycline, with any of these other drug classes where you just quit using it and then so the it goes away? So the issue is you're talking about is, is cycling. Right. And uh, there's, you know, I know within hospitals it doesn't work because the timeline's too short. Um, you know, whether, and we have no control as a nation over antibiotics, right? So no one's ever done like a big study. Like if we, except in, I mean, what's worked is like in targeting of the drug resistance, like in, uh, was it, uh, in Sweet, was it? One of the North European countries targeted, they tested everyone from MRSA until it was all gone. Like they got everyone, anybody gets presumed, you know, from another country gets presumed to have MRSA and they put them in isolation. They treat them all, and basically they got rid of MRSA in their country. But it's because of targeting drug resistance, carriers, colonizers, infections. So with a socialized right? healthcare system, you might be able to do that. Well, with the system, yeah. right? We have no system in the United States. Mm -hmm. I can tell you how many cows are in every single county in the United in the world, and it's the United States. Every county, I can tell you exactly how many cows there are. I cannot tell you how much MRSA there is, how much drug resistance, you know, bad gram negative rods there are in any county. So why would you want to know how many cows there are? <laughs> well, I'd rather because I don't know. But this thing is, there's we have no system. Oh, I see where you're, I see I, where I, you're going. I now. can't tell you how bad the problem is in the United States. Truth. But uh, bad. Oh, thank you. Oh sure. And you've already laid the groundwork for next year. Yeah, I'll start with seed of next year. I'll just pick up in the last couple of slides. All right. A pleasure. Yeah, thank you. You guys Mr. Are, Altman, when do you start? We have two of them set up already. Do you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's fantastic. Get early. Yes. Absolutely. Well, because you know, you ask people. I mean, you know this is that you you know everyone's mom told them. Yes. My mom told me. Everyone's mom told And it's like. Yeah, it just makes no sense, and uh, and so the more people we can get off it, the better. Yeah. So I think that's that's fantastic.
I think the work that you're doing in the past. I use Matt's the same protocol that you use back east. Or is it working, kids? Um, it's a little bit different because of the uh, lack of um, well, lack of what allergy. Yeah, right. No, I know that. Really? Yeah. So it's like I can find out what kind of CME type. Yeah. All right. Contact me. I start working on it usually in July.